Well, welcome and, and good morning, uh, everyone. I'm Devjani Ganguly, uh, the director of the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures. And uh, I have the pleasure of uh, hosting our um, Mellon Fellow and uh, the our presenter this morning, Douglas Fordham, uh, the professor of art history at uh, UVA. Um, so just a little background uh, for those who uh, are not familiar with our Mellon Fellowships Program. Uh, so from 2015 to 2021, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, funded a series of uh, faculty fellowships, uh, graduate fellowships, and uh, several humanities laboratories at our institute. And uh, over, the, over the years, we've uh, been so fortunate um, to, to um, um, see uh, the, 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 just the sheer rich, the rich yield of monographs uh, from uh, our faculty fellows and also fellows based at our various labs. And um, um, we, we're taking this opportunity this year and the following year uh, to showcase and, and, and invite uh, our various uh, fellows who've been authors uh, uh, of some astonishingly rich monographs to present their work. And um, Douglas uh, uh, seminar is the second seminar in our series uh, of, of Mellon books. And uh, I have great pleasure in, in welcoming him this morning. Uh, Douglas Fordham, uh, as, as, as most of you would know, is a historian of art and the British Empire and explores a wide array of visual art from the 17th century to the present in the Anglophone world. He's the author and editor of many influential volumes in the field. And these include an edited volume, Art in the British Empire with Tim Barringer and Jeff Keeley, uh, published in 2007, which helped place empire at the study, at the center of the study of British art. His first monograph, British Art and the Seven Years' War, Allegiance and Autonomy, published in 2010, examined the relationship of imperial politics to artistic organization in London in the mid 18th century. His second monograph featured in our seminar this morning, Aquatint Worlds, Travel, Print and the Empire, was published by Yale University Press in 2019. And this book evolved out of a project he was working on as a fellow at our institute in 2016 and 17. Uh, the book considers how the newly discovered medium of aquatint printmaking conditioned the representation and reception of the world beyond Europe in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Currently, Douglas is working on contemporary Australian Aboriginal printmaking, and his project here explores what this Indigenous print tradition can teach us about the colonial visual record of Australia and the troubling tradition of Aboriginal representation. With the assistance of extraordinary curators and collections at UVA's Klugiru Collection of Aboriginal Art, Douglas is keen to explore how Indigenous voices can be brought more fully into the history of art and empire. Douglas earned his doctorate at Yale in 2003, uh, and from then until 2005, he was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Columbia. He joined UVA right after and has received research and publication grants from the Paul Mellon Center in London, the Rare Book School in Charlottesville, and the Folger Institute in Washington, DC. In addition to scholarly conferences, Douglas has delivered public lectures at the Metropolitan Museum, the British Museum, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, and the Yale Center for British Art. Douglas will be joined this morning by Tom Young from the University of Warwick, uh, who will serve as a discussant after Douglas's talk. Um, Tom is a Lever Hume Trust Early Career Fellow in the Department of Art History at Warwick. His research interests include lithography, the relationship between art and colonialism, 19th century South Asian art history, and 19th century East and Central European art. In 2020, Tom was the project curator of the British Museum's exhibition Tantra, Enlightenment to Revolution. The show charted Tantra's sustained revolutionary impact from its early transformation of Hinduism and Buddhism to the fight for Indian independence and the rise of the 1960s counterculture. 
So over to Douglas, who will share aspects and insights from his book, Aqua Tint World, Travel, Print and Empire. Welcome, Douglas. Douglas, you'll need to mute, unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Deb Johnny. Thank you so much for that, for that introduction and for the invitation to speak. I'm also um, very pleased that Tom has agreed to join us today. Um, there are really three communities that helped to um, make this, this book possible. Uh, my colleagues at, uh, the art in the art department here at UVA, uh, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, and I, I recognize there are a number of uh, my English colleagues are here in the audience, and thanks for showing up. And, um, and then the IHGC. Um, and so it's really um, a pleasure to be able to present this uh, to those who, in front of those who've, been, who've made uh, such a big difference in the project. Aquatent Worlds is a book about travel and it appeared in late 2019, just as the world shut down. Um, and I haven't really presented it in its finished form, I realize. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to to think back over these two very strange years to, to, to what this is. And um, it's been an interesting opportunity. And I've decided I wanna to try to take the big picture. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how the project took shape and what I see it, um, what kind of conversations in terms of art and empire I see it taking part in. Uh, I'll provide a few examples from the book, but I want to try to stay out of the weeds as much as possible. I think this will go for about 20-25 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for Tom to respond and for questions if anyone has them. Um, many years ago I co-edited this volume uh, with Tim Berenger and Jeff Quilly. I was the junior partner um, which is why I put my name last there on the edited line. And um, it was a really formative experience for me. And I, I think it was really the beginning of what became Aquatent Worlds um, and in that we had 20 essays from uh, scholars from around the world, many of them from ex-colonial or British Commonwealth countries um, who were working on uh, in archives and on objects that were local to them, where they were, uh, where, where they were seated and usually in universities uh, in these countries. Um, and, um, and what under, but mostly they had been publishing these works and these studies in what would have been considered regional history journals. Uh, the major art history journals like Art History in the UK or Art Bulletin in the US really had no interest in publishing what they had to say. And, um, and British art history, which was you know, very metropolitan focused, and I'm talking about kind of around 2000 when we organized the conference uh, out of which this volume grew, um, was also you know, really would not have considered that work uh, essential to anything about the history of British art. It would have been simply a kind of peripheral kind of story uh, along the margins of what would have been the mainline narratives. And so what we set out to do in that book was to try to, to bring these uh, stories together, these um, very specific kind of deep dive case studies in many cases together, um, and in order to try to think about that as part of cent as a central part of the history of British art. Um, it was partially successful. And I say that because I, I, we really struggled with the introduction to that book because I just don't feel like we really had the terms, the categories um, or the methods to really to describe how these case studies fit together. And I was really intrigued by that and, and slightly kind of troubled by that. Like, what is it that, what is it that makes art, any instance of art making um, in different parts of the world imperial? What kind of constitutes that thread? Or are there, are there larger narratives to be drawn? Or is it of necessity a story that's going to have to be fractured from here on out and, 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 and just you know, um, uh, pluralistic in, in every single way? Um, one of the answers that kind of struck me in the years after that was the, the importance of, of print mediation and um, that it was printed images that mediated and helped to construct popular palatable visions of the British Empire. 
It was in the networks of print production, distribution, and reception that diverse artistic practices became part of what could be termed an imperial visual culture. Or at least that seemed to me a, a good place to kind of start working through some of those issues. And we already had one model for this in uh, print scholarship, certainly, which is this very interesting, extensive um, uh, bibliography on cartography and on the ways in which map making in the early modern period uh, brought together disparate types of measuring and, and representation into a centralized image of empire. And I'm showing you here uh, Faden's map of India from 1793. Uh, almost every map in the 18th century was etched and engraved. It was in Talio, which is to say etched and engraved uh, on a copper plate, um, which enabled the, the combination of image and text on the same, um, you know, neatly within the same image. Although keeping in mind, it all had to be reversed when it was printed. Um, and this map also includes, um, you know, the, this is a, uh, it includes uh, territorial designations of what the East India Company had recently conquered in Southern India and where the battles took place. And so it could be adapted and adjusted very quickly, right? You could even take the same plate and add new battles onto it and reissue it. And so it had, um, so we knew, we had a very good idea of how this kind of uh, image making worked. But I was also looking as I was thinking through this problem to really bracket out cartography as much as possible or bracket out the instrumentality of map making to be able to consider more expressive images. And I'm thinking I was it was images like this that I that I was um, particularly interested in engaging with, which is an aqua tent print by Samuel Daniel uh, in his African scenery and animals. Um, and that's when I kind of realized, in fact, that most of the prints that I was interested in dealing with were had aqua tent on them, which was not something that I had ever really thought terribly much about. And in fact, in the history of art, aqua tinting, to the extent that it shows up in kind of the main, the mainline histories of art, often shows up with Francisco Goya and his caprichos in particular. Um, and, um, and often, that's also often the last mention of aqua tint in the history of art, um, if it, but um, although of course aqua tinting continues to be a fine art practice um, that, that, that artists are using you know, right, right into the present in often very dynamic and interesting ways. So what is aqua tent? And I like this plate because it just shows it so clearly. If you go into a detail, what you see is the tone on the plate is, is what is aqua tinted. It's an intaglio process, which is to say it's etched with acid. Um, and what it is is that the uh, rosin grains are distributed um, on the surface of a plate through a dust box or through a liquid process. Um, and what it reads as to the, to the viewer once it's printed on paper is, um, white islands in a black sea. And those white islands are the dust flecks, or sorry, the, the rosin flecks that are on the plate It's that are heated to adhere. And then the black sea is where the acid bites into the copper plate around it. And the beauty of aqua tenting is that once you put, once you lay that ground on, you can, you can, um, you can re-immerse it as many times as possible to deepen the, the, the depth of tone. And you see this really easily. Can you see my you can see my cursor on here on the on the image um, so that here we have a light. Um, this would have been bitten first. Um, you can see the tone. This would have been stopped out completely with varnish. And then this would have been bitten. And then they would have stopped this out and then rebitten the plate in acid again to get this much darker tone. Right. And so you can do that as many times as you need to create these these tonal variations. I was surprised to find though, once I started thinking, okay, actually this is really a kind of an aquatent printmaking project, you know, aquatent and empire project, um, that there was actually surprisingly little scholarship on aquatent book illustration or other kinds of commercial forms in the history of art. There wasn't a kind of specific literature, but not in the history of art particularly. Um, I began to realize that aquatent printmaking was inextricably bound to the representation of, of travel and empire between roughly 1770 and 1830, which was the, the pinnacle of its commercial success as a reproductive medium. Um, 
And in fact, the artist who brought aqua tint to one of its highest levels of technical perfection, certainly in England, but really throughout Europe, was an artist named William Daniel, who is well known in, um, in the literature for being an artist who traveled out to India and, and made his representations of India. Um, William and his, uh, his uh, older uncle Thomas, um, uh, who was also an aqua tenter, but um, uh, not quite as skilled as William would become, um, printed this image of the mausoleum of Amir Kusero in Delhi um, in 1801. Um, as part of their, Orient, their, their monumental publication called Oriental Scenery. And the way that this plate was made is you would print, um, you would prepare the copper plate with, uh, a with an aquatint ground, um, and then you would bite it in progressively and then print it in uh, kind of a light sepia ink with the, under with the expectation, with the plan that you would then go in with light by hand with watercolor just like you would the same watercolors you would use to make a watercolor in nature. And then you would add, brush in some green, you'd brush in some blue, you brush in the red highlights here. And they would, because the, the tone was already on the plate, you actually, that actually reads as varying shades of green when in fact it's just a single wash of green in many cases. They, you wanna make the hand coloring as simple as possible because um, if you're doing, let's say a hundred copies uh, of a plate, that's an awful lot of hand coloring. So you want to try to, and that would often be then shipped out to um, done as piecework by young artists um, and uh, even kind of as a cottage industry. And if we zoom into this plate, right, so we're going there into the center, we see the kind of magic that this is because initially when people, when artists were aqua tinting, they would kind of etch outlines and then they would just use aqua tint to make the tones. When in fact, someone like William Daniel, at, at, when he really gets the hang of this, is aqua tinting all of this by stopping out so that we have the Arabic script, um, this amazing carved screen, the figures, it's all done by stopping out. It, and, and, and then by adding some, some highlight colors here and there at the end to make it pop. And this is how we would see oriental scenery in the library back then um, and in many collections today where it hasn't been unbound. So as I considered how Aquatint shaped both the, re the representation and reception of travel outside Europe, I returned to a collection that I had become acquainted with as a grad student at Yale that was at the Yale Center for British Art, but that I now return to as a, as a gold mine, as something that I had not realized quite its value until I, until I began this project. This is the Yale Center for British Arts um, copy of Oriental Scenery. And you can see down here, this is um, the letterpress description of the plates was actually uh, done on a much smaller format. And here, oh, sorry, there it's in its original blue wrappers and you can see the difference in scale. And then you can see some, um, this is called elephant folio. And then we have some smaller folio, more standard folio sizes behind it, which are also, um, picture books. And these are all in the collection. These are all coming from the, what's called the J.R. Abbey collection of, um, of, of picture books in aquatint and lithography. That uh, it was collected by J.R. Abbey, who was a Brit. Um, he was a brewer um, who collected these books in the early, in the first half of the 20th century. And then Paul Mellon bought the entire collection of 1,917 books um, kind of in the 1950s, while Abbey was cataloging them, they all came, um, and um, and it was this was the collection that became the kind of foundation out of which I, I, I formulated my conclusions for this project. And for those of you that like charts, I, I, I know this is virtually unreadable in the few seconds I'm going to show it, but the, the part of the Abbey collection, I was actually only interested in a single part, which was the 728 books that dealt with um, travel in aqua tint and lithography. And you can see these are Abbey's own designations, uh, books that covered the whole world, Europe, Africa, and St. Helena. Uh, the Near East, you know, India, Burma, Ceylon, et cetera. And then here I've broken it down um, by um, the decade in which they were initially published, the first, the first publication of each of those. And for me, one of the takeaways of this, just this very simple analysis, 
was um, that these that from the very beginning these books were representing the entire world. It wasn't like the representation of Europe came first and then India and then China. And then it was really very much a global. If we think of, the, of how the world came to see, how Britons came to see the world in color uh, through hand colored aquatint, it was, um, you know, um, it was, it, it, the entire world really from the outset, which I thought was interesting. And of course, the other thing we have to keep in mind, and I'll come back to this point, but that these images, you know, the, that the, 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 the publications compound and the libraries just grow and grow and grow so that the visual archive of the places you can go um, in print um, just expand dramatically in these, in, in this, um, uh, this is an 80 year period. Um, and I should also mention that for me, most also, I was actually, for the most part, uh, predominantly interested in the first half of this uh, collection, uh, because around the 1820s, the medium switches from aquatent to lithography predominantly. And I was focused only on the books that were that were made in aquatent. So to, again, returning to this as a kind of art historical question, I, I think initially I was thinking that I was gonna be working on aquatent prints as individual works of art, because that's what art historians do. We're interested in the unique work of art and um, we like to get as close to the original inspiration and conception as possible. Um, and of course that means there had been some interesting writing, for example, on the Daniels in India. There'd been a, a lot of work done on their original itineraries through different parts of India and a lot of emphasis placed on their original watercolors that they made um, while they were on site in front of uh, different major monuments. Um, I was astonished to learn though that you would get to a print like this of um, Karla, um, the, the Buddhist Chaitya at Karla, it was referred to here as Akvera, which was actually the name of the Hindu temple that's just out front here. But this is typically referred to um, by, by, by scholars of ancient Indian art as uh, by Karla, the, um, the site name, um, that as astonishingly convincing as this image is, and as accurate as it truly is, this is not a, a temple site that Thomas and William Daniel ever saw. They never. They simply never went to this site. This is done entirely from um, secondhand sources. And, um, and also, this was also a mystery to me in that this was, although this was done, this is one of their finest prints from India, and it's done on the same scale and the same style as Oriental scenery, this was a print that was not included in Oriental scenery. And so there were all these kind of mysteries that began to it was impossible basically to just take these prints individually. I mean, there were too many kind of questions raised by them that I couldn't answer. And what I finally, what, I, what became very obvious to me is that this was gonna be a project about book illustration more than about kind of printmaking or at least equally about, equally about both. Um, so I learned, for example, and this is gonna be the one kind of case study that I'll present as quickly as, um, uh, quite briefly, but that um, the, that Carla, the temple at Carla, the cave temple in Carla, had been discovered by an artist named James Wales in 1792. Uh, he, uh, this is a painting by James Wales of uh, the Maratha Peshwa uh, and Nana Fednavis, his prime minister, um, that he, um, that James Wales did as a commission for the British resident at Pune. Um, Wales was based in Bombay. He was traveling back and forth between Bombay and Pune. And that's when uh, some local um, informants told him, well, there is this temple site not far off the road between the two, you might wanna visit it. And when he discovered this, he kind of immediately kind of recognized that maybe he, this was his chance to become an antiquarian. And what he set himself was a task that he had no idea how impossible it was actually going to be, which was to document visually and um, through measurements, uh, floor plans, every cave temple in India. And he described that as Oriental antiquities, as we see 
in this handwritten uh, prospectus for a publication. And this prospectus also, by the way, uh, suggests, um, it, it was interesting because it um, uh, suggests that it was gonna be printed entirely in Bombay. Um, and then in later prospecti, he said, no, actually this, this can't be done in Bombay. It has to be printed in London. And that's something that we see with the Daniels um, also when they were working in Calcutta, that intaglio printmaking, uh, the, the economics of it were very, very difficult to do out, out in these presidency towns or outside of London, basically. The cost of paper, the, the skills needed to print um, uh, were really, it was, even if you wanted to print something in about an Indian subject and then sell it in that Indian market, it was cheaper to have it printed in London and then sent back to Calcutta or Bombay or um, Canton uh, to sell. And so that, that, is, that is one of the dynamics that's kind of central to this moment that would change as lithography uh, would take off later in the 19th century. So as James Wales undertook this um, uh, slightly insane project to document every cave temple in India, and he um, and of course every, the more he learned, the more he realized that there were places he hadn't seen, and there were cave temples that he hadn't uh, recognized. Um, he en he enlisted two main draftsmen to help him with this project. One was a soldier that he bought out of the East India Company service named Robert Maybon, who was an excellent draftsman. Um, and the other was a Marathi sculptor named Gangaram Chintaman Tambat, um, and um, who learned, kind of took up this Western style of draftsmanship, but combined it with his own kind of um, Marathi trad visual traditions and sensibilities. And um, this is just this remarkable um, image that's in the, the Yale Center for British Art that he produced a drawing of that temple at Karla. Here's the main front and here's the left wing that we saw. And I'll just bring it down so we can see this comparison. This is uh, again, the temple, um, you go in and there's two flanks and then there's the main entrance. And this was actually designed almost as a kind of uh, panorama uh, or kind of folding diorama so that you would fold the sides and then you would have fold the sides here on these two creases. And it was just like you were entering the temple front itself. And I just wanna, I'm bringing attention to these three elephants that are down here. So th this is a photograph of Carla today. Um, you can see that all three trunks of the elephant supporting elephants have been, were, have been broken. And that's true, we see from Gangaram's uh, drawing, that was true as early as the 18th century that those, and then we see the Daniels reinterpretation of this evidence where they've added back two trunks in order to increase legibility. Um, but I think one, one can also see again, like this is one of the, this would have been one of the main, really one of the main sources they used to recreate this picturesque, uh, ostensibly, um, you know, sun dappled moment, uh, captured moment in time that they, that is an entire fiction that they've created in Aquatone. Um, and then the other part of the mystery, like why, why wasn't this folded into oriental scenery? Um, there, there were answers to that too, as part of this larger notion of bookmaking. Um, and that was that um, James Wales died in 1795 in another cave temple. He died of like in a view, a very kind of late 18th century way of dying in, as he was making sketches in another cave temple at Canary. And um, then, um, and all he left behind was this kind of undigested mass of sketches, drawings, floor plans. His eldest daughter married the British resident at Pune. Um, they went back to England with this huge box of materials and they kind of dumped them at the foot of Thomas and William Daniel and said, can you, can you, can you finish this project? To which the Daniels, and, I'm, and I don't have, unfortunately we don't have any documentation of payments or exactly what the terms of that agreement might have been. Um, they made a, a series of prints um, that um, are in the British Museum Prints and Drawings Collection that were not, that, did ne that never became part of Oriental scenery. And so this is one of those really beautifully finished prints um, that they did to try to kind of put some, some you know, to, to bring that Wales uh, project to some kind of fruition. But it was clear that they didn't want to bring it, my, my sense is they didn't want to bring it into Oriental scenery because they didn't want to confuse 
for their own firsthand observations and discoveries uh, with those of someone else and with a project that they hadn't seen. And they made one exception in that of the six volumes of Oriental scenery, one is um, dedicated uh, to uh, the temples um, uh, that um, the, at Elora that James Wales had done that they had not had a chance to see. And I think Elora was just too spectacular not to include, but they very specifically kind of isolated that as one volume, the kind of James Wales volume that they acknowledged was made secondhand. Um, and then, but these other outlier temples that weren't part of Elora, they didn't want to confuse the message that they were the prime authors can, uh, and um, um, publishers, engravers of oriental scenery. And so all of this is just uh, what I just want to kind of, the, the lesson I kind of want to, to emphasize out of all of this um, was that the authorship of these books, um, which was so important, a, a component of copyright and of sales uh, strategies back in London, you know, Oriental Scenery says that it's in, you know, it's really by Thomas and William Daniel, but of course, in practice, the authorship extends to all kinds of local artists, informants, scholars, um, artistic rivals, uh, East India Company officials who granted access and military victories that opened, opened up the path, right? And so what it, the, one of the lessons for me from this, um, and I think that it's true in uh, nearly all of these, it, these um, publications from this era is that the book publication lends a great deal more insight into the relationship of art to empire than, than artistic uh, authorship or analysis on its own could possibly provide. The other two books that I focus on um, in Aquatent Worlds, and I'm just, I'm not gonna go into to them here. I'm just gonna show a, a, a sample of each. One was Samuel Daniels, African Scenery and Animals. Samuel was uh, the younger brother of uh, William, um, and so there's a family connection there as well. Um, and when he basically, having seen what they had done, what they accomplished with Oriental Scenery, he went off to make an Oriental Scenery of Southern Africa. And um, in practice, though, there was no way of doing the same kind of picturesque views in Southern Africa because there weren't the ancient ruins that he had, would have access to. There, It was just a very different place, and so the focus ended up being natural history, so uh, particularly quadrupeds um, that could be hunted and, and, and viewed there. Um, but the other part was really, although it doesn't sound it in African scenery and animals, it was really an attempt to pr provide a glimpse into the pre-colonial peoples of Southern Africa. And so the Ngosa, um, uh, the Zulu, um, the Tswana, are, be, are shown in a state that, has, that is, has no connection to colonial contact, as if they've been untouched for the last two, you know, 100 years of, of colonial engagement with uh, the Southern Cape, with the Western and Southern Cape. And then the other publication was um, William Alexander's Costume of China, which um, details his own firsthand observations that he made on the McCartney expedition in the 1790s. And here I love just to present this. I think this is a really a helpful kind of image to see what we're talking about. When we talk about the magic of Aquatent uh, imagery for I think the audience at that time is that this is a soft ground etching. Etchings had been made for hundreds of years since the Italian Renaissance. This technology is basically unchanged, although um, the subject matter is certainly new, which is the sacrifice in a temple. Um, but then to this, they would take that exact plate and then they would add the way William Alexander did it, he would then add it an aquatent ground and then hand coloring to the image we see at the bottom, which is the image you would see in a book. Um, and you know, really see how it helps to distinguish the, the materiality of Chinese culture, um, sorry, um, uh, with the sculptures in the background, the painted frieze that goes behind it. And my choice to, um, to focus on these three books um, was partly because of geographic dispersion um, and geographic significance to the to the British to British imperial either ambitions or um, actual um, practice circa 1800. 
but also because there was just extraordinary archive of material to work from. It, for each of these publications, basically, you could go, you could follow the artist out, you could find original uh, watercolors and, and drawings and sketches uh, to, the to the travel of those archives back to London, where their editorial choices were made, where they were published, and then where there were book reviews published. And this is one, another thing about working on illustrated books that I hadn't quite appreciated, but these were all reviewed in, in the literary press. Although there was some debate about that at first, like, should we be reviewing this? This is really more about art, but as long as it had letterpress, which all these books had letterpress, although it was very, often it was very, very minimal kind of letterpress. But as long as it had letterpress, it would, these books were largely reviewed in, in the press. And these are also wonderful kind of insights into the reception at the time. Um, so as this project took shape, I have to say that um, there were moments when the old anxieties around writing that introduction to Art in the British Empire returned. Like, oh God, I'm doing three totally separate projects. I don't see how these are related. I don't know how I'm gonna, you know, um, other than the medium, I don't really get what, how to talk about these three together. Um, and, and that required the, the, the introduction, of course, of the fourth world, which was the, the printing and book publishing world of London. And that is, of course, the site where all three of these other books were made. All of the, really, all of the major picture books of the period were made. It was the place they were marketed. It was the place where they were often read, and sold. And um, that became the kind of, you know, the, 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 the portion that completed the picture that I was trying to tell in Aquatent Worlds. Um, the other thing that you can kind of glimpse here, and, and this has been something that had been noted by other scholars and, and referred to as kind of an imperial picturesque is that there is a style to these books, right? There is a tonality, um, a kind of cool uh, coloring um, that, um, that, that certainly was reassuring to an English public that, that guaranteed the art, the artness of the artfulness of these works. Um, and, um, but it was also an idea that I was slightly uncomfortable with, right? Because as I was thinking about these, if you take individual plates from any of these books, you can definitely talk about the stylistic similarities, but as books, these, um, these individual books were making very different arguments about where the parts of the world they were interested in. They were interested in very different aspects. So, the, you know, the Daniels in India were really preoccupied with architectural history. Um, William Alexander in China was really preoccupied with trade. Like what are the objects that Chinese people, everyday Chinese people used and what might be the objects that we could sell to them in order to help balance the, the, the trade deficit with China, which was already significant in, uh, at this moment. How, how, how can we load those ships with something going back to England, or, or sorry, how to, the other way around. We, they had things to come back. How do, we, how do we load these ships with something to sell to the Chinese that they would like? And then of course, with the uh, Southern African um, images, it was overwhelmingly preoccupied with kind of notions of human origins and proto-ethnography uh, and proto-anthropology. Um, And so what I came to kind of think about was these books um, in some ways uh, became, were less than the sum of their parts once they returned to London. Or to put it another way, the stylistic similarities across them, the artfulness of them uh, came with certain kind of high costs when it came to the translation of some of these more complicated ideas that the authors themselves were trying to convey. And so one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that, that the style itself was being taught um, to every day, to the same consumers who were buying these books or, or checking these books out of lending libraries. They were learning how to paint also through Aquatent. So these same publishers that were publishing like Ackerman and others that were publishing these picture books were also, picturing, um, were also publishing picture uh, drawing manuals. And in those drawing manuals, they would show you how to draw at the top left with etching. The etching was like, this is what your drawing needs to look like. And then they would add aquatent tones and say, this is what your dead coloring needs to look like when you would brush in gray tones. And then of course the watercolor at the end was added exactly the same way, whether you were in the field 
or whether you were uh, making the picture book. This is the exact same watercolors are being used uh, for both demonstration and for what these, um, uh, what an amateur would use in the field. Or for that matter, what Samuel Daniel would use in Southern Africa. And so I was really struck by, rather than an imperial picturesque, I, I, I came to like this idea of a haptic picturesque, which was to say that we have to keep in mind that the English public viewing these books in many cases actually could imagine how this image was made. The three-part process of how you would make an aquatent print was exactly the same three-part process they were taught to make drawings of, of the Lake District, right? And so they could imagine themselves standing in this position, taking in this view of Lion's Head in Cape Town um, by, um, you know, I, I think so this, so this notion, of, and the haptic picturesque is an oxymoron, of course, because what's more visual than the picturesque, but I do think there, there is this kind of notion again of, um, and, th and this goes to the kind of ideology of imperial representation, of a kind of indoctrination of, um, you know, the Englishman's right to ramble across the countryside becomes the Englishman's right to ramble across the world and to take in disinterested views, no matter where he might be, and to find where those might lie. Um, so finally, let me just wrap up really quickly with, um, th this is um, the repository of the arts uh, was where some of these books were sold. And there was even a library upstairs for, for picture books. Um, and that library um, was, um, in, included the three books I've just shown you, as well as hundreds of others. And it's to my, it's my understanding, it's the first library for picture books in the world. Um, but very quickly, Aquatent went down market. And I think we don't want to underestimate how quickly the kind of aesthetics and economics changed so that Dr. Syntax in Search of the Picturesque is both made in Aquatent, but it's also a parody of Aquatent books in bookmaking. And then finally, we had arrived at this last image I'll just show, which is, um, this is called The World in Miniature and included six volumes on India with roughly the same number of images that the Daniels had done in Oriental Scenery, but it was one one hundredth of the cost. Of course, they're very small aquatents, but they're still hand-colored aquatents and they're for uh, the same market, but a much, or at least a much broader uh, market that could afford this kind of product. And so kind of with that, we see the, the end of this very ambitious uh, period of Aquatent bookmaking. And I realized I went, uh, as I tend to do, I went much longer because I, I improvised as I went. So um, I'll stop right there because I don't want to cut Tom off. Thanks, thanks Douglas. And over to you, Tom. Yeah, so I'll just talk for, I think about five to 10 minutes about, you know, um, why I found the book so engaging from, you know, from, from a personal level, I, I, I'm focused on the, the global history of photography. So the sort of the medium that just comes up, that just comes after Aquatint. Um, but also so, so why I think the book makes such an important intervention into the history of British art. Um, I think given that the book itself is so focused on uh, the material properties of, of Aquatint and the aesthetic uh, qualities of Aquatint, it's uh, maybe useful to start talking about those, those aspects of the book itself, Aquatint World itself first. So I don't know how many people in the audience have a copy, but it's quite hefty. And it's um, the illustrations in it, I mean, they're, they're copious and they have a really high, high quality. Um, and I think that's important. It, it has several effects, um, but given that the book is and that makes this argument really about um, sort of the visual power of Aquatint, uh, what sort of work Aquatint was able to do because of its aesthetic properties. Um, and I think Douglas, your argument is, in some ways is that, that that sort of power has been overlooked and actually with the, the digitization of archives, it's increasingly hard to really understand the, the, the power of Aquatint as a medium. The book in, with these copious illustrations actually really brings that home. It's, it almost lets you do the sort of art history on the page. So, you know, you have the, the works there and you're, you're engaging with them, you know, yourself and then the arguments going along with it. Uh, so for instance, the argument that, uh, uh, the, the sort of the difference between the, the construction of objectivity and subjectivity and then the Enlightenment and the uh, Romantic period. And sort of Nigel Leask's argument that 
actually the, the, the separation of romantic imagination and subjectivity from uh, enlightenment taxonomy and knowledge uh, happened much later in the 19th century and for very over the, the first half of the period um, there was actually this struggle really to try and integrate this sort of exotic subjective imaginative uh, aesthetic with forms of enlightenment knowledge I think that's made very clearly in these these uh, um, the Aquitaine illustrations where Douglas you're talking about uh, the sort of information for instance that the Daniels are trying to include and struggling with whilst also producing these sort of quite charismatic uh, images um, I think the the second way that the, the illustration helps to sort of really solidify this argument is um, it, the, the sort of in the first chapter there's a sort of tour de force of um, Aquitaine's origin so it goes from um, uh, Peter Burdett, who, who sends it off to Benjamin Franklin, and then Benjamin Franklin gets in touch with Joseph Banks, who's uh, on the first uh, the first voyage of Captain Cook, and you know there's uh, this attempt to sort of link it to scientific uh, scientific exploration, the early English colonial exploration, and uh, eventually it, it, that's sort of slightly unsuccessful. And it ends up going to Paul Sandby, who's who we all know as art historians, as you know founder of sort of uh, topographic English school watercolor, the you know the origins of this sort of um, I think Paul Mellon is quoted in the book himself is talking about the way these images cre created sort of um, ideas about a British sensibility and as British aesthetic. Um, your sort of excavation of these origins um, and, and the, sh the showing that the, the links to this history actually of colonial exploration, um, in some ways returning just like art in the British Empire has sought to do, you know, return empire to the, to the heart of the understanding of British art, to return to return uh, empire to the study of illustrated travel, uh, uh, printed uh, print illustration um, and travel, is in some ways to return empire to the to the heart of this sort of medium that created ideas about uh, British sensibility, um, a British aesthetic, and British national identity, um, and this this uh, this sort of ideal type of the British metropolitan gentleman sat in his armchair in London, having sort of access to uh, to visually consume scenes from around the world. Um, I think, you know, when you're reading the book and you're in, say, in an armchair and going through and seeing these scenes from uh, these scenes, you're, you're sort of the arguments there about the sort of visually seductive, the powerful uh, work that these aquatins were able to do. But then the argument is there to try and reinforce the fact that this, you know, the, what the, these lithographs are doing in some way, sorry, that these aquatins are doing in some ways is erasing uh, the violence of race, some in some ways erasing the violence of this uh, colonial history. Um, I think that the Daniels use this term guiltless spoliations, right? So I think the the, the Aquitaine's illustrations in the book make uh, very tangible the way in which Aquitaine's were able to, to transform aspects of this colonial, colonial uh, and imperial history into objects of uh, visual delight, uh, aesthetic delight. That's made very powerfully in the book. Um, yeah, and I think, so I mean, that brings, um, what time are we on? I think I just, that sort of brings to the, um, I think the main intervention that the book makes, which is, you know, rather than responding to calls uh, to sort of crit uh, reassess or critique perhaps um, the histories of uh, colonialism, imperialism, the construction of uh, racism and other forms of, di of discrimination, in some ways the book makes an argument for what art history can offer that, uh, that reassessment, um, what, what art history can, can provide and help, you know, with this reassessment of, particularly in, the, in the, this book's case, this reassessment of Britain's colonial, colonial past. What sort of tools does the art historian have to contribute to, to this reassessment? Um, and I think that's, if this is sort of, in, this is mainly done through the structure of the book. So I think Douglas was already talking about how there's these three case studies, these sort of three in-depth case studies that are sort of sandwiched between uh, thematic chapters. Um, so this, the fourth chapter in, on London uh, focuses in a sort of a Heideggerian sense of world making so that uh, cumulatively aquatintists were setting the parameters for the way um, uh, British people were thinking about themselves and, and London was part of within the empire. But in many ways, you know, the, 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 the case study showed that actually a lot of this, this sort of what you would call a sort of imperial ideology was um, I think you used uh, Douglas the term discourses information. So that actually it's, they're responding to these contingencies uh, of the colonial situation there. Uh, and then many of these contingencies are based on things, the facts that art historians would focus on. So uh, agency in a much more Gramscian sense of what 
you know, what was the artist wanting to achieve? What were their capabilities? Who were they, who were they in response to? Um, and in that sense, then, that these ideologies that are, we're talking about at the heart of the, the metropole, so this sort of age of aquatint and that's informing uh, uh, Britain crossing the Imperial Meridian and the construction of a sort of quite distinct imperial ideology in the metropole, uh, the book shows very nicely how these are being formed in actually across the world in quite uh, specific colonial situations through contingencies and then traveling back in quite tangible ways as, you know, the material history of Aquitaine. Um, so I think it, the book makes a very powerful contribution to what, um, you know, the art history can offer a history of imperialism, but also in some ways what British art history can, can offer, because it's thinking through that, that global history through uh, you know, through Britain, through London as a centre and, and its peripheries. I think I'll stop there so we have a, a bit more time for questions. But uh, yeah, um, I think I would recommend to all interested in, you know, not just the history of British art, but those who are trying to think through questions of how the visual and how the aesthetic um, relate to histories of colonialism, imperialism, the construction of racial discrimination. I think the book actually makes a very strong argument for what our history can offer for that assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And we began five minutes late, so we have a good 10 minutes for questions. And please put up your electronic hand so I can see um, you. Um, so there's a question from Kelvin Parnell. And I'd invite you to uh, um, introduce uh, yourself. Not all of you are from the University of Virginia, so it would be wonderful to know who you are. So Kelvin, Kelvin Parnell. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I'm Kelvin Parnell Jr. I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, art department at the University of Virginia. Um, heard Doug was talking about this project for uh, quite some time, so happy to see him uh, present on it uh, since it kind of came out during a kind of tumultuous time. Uh, I had two quick questions. Um, one of them, you, you stated that Aquatint helped shape uh, the British people, how they came to see the world in color. And I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about how color, um, like what are the stakes or the importance of seeing the world in color through this particular medium? Um, and the second question kind of is, is adjacent to that one. When I was seeing the Sam Daniels, you know, you're talking about it being a uh, picturesque or oriental scene of pre-colonial um, Southern Africa. And I'm wondering just kind of what are the also the stakes of providing that type of image during this um, near, near height of British colonialism. Uh, how, how does that mediate the perception of empire? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kelman. That, those are two huge questions. I, I might just take the first and then we can take the second one offline because I, I mean, I'd love to I'd love to continue this conversation. Yeah, with you. for sure. Um, the you know, the, so the the color is problematic, was problematic in printmaking. And, you know, Tom's thinking about lithography in the 19th century and, and then chromolithography becomes this big, so that there is a, um, but for the most, there, there were, to hand color a print um, could provide more information, but it could also immediately signal that you're not dealing with fine art anymore. Mm. Like, the one thing you were never supposed to do was like you would never take a Durer print and and start coloring it. Yeah. <laughs> Although some people did, but like that was, but it was um it was a mark of a certain and, and in fact, one of the only places where hand coloring was deemed accessible uh, acceptable and um and not kind of debasing the artistic quality was in travel books um and uh, travel mm. books botany books um medical books. Right, there were so they had a kind of scientific reason was was the and that um, so the Daniels walk among others walk a really fine line I think between um, making art, aesthetic artistic claims and making kind of scientific objective um, mm -hmm. you know, claims for um, and so and then just to go and that does link to race because I think um, you know I I use one example in the book which I was really struck by there was a debate about whether um, Indians and Chinese are have had a shared descent descent mm -hmm. and um, and one person in a picture book said that um, that a certain group of southern Africans looked an awful lot like Chinese and then it got really trashed by a reviewer and then a response came that was an engraved response 
that in a, in a subsequent edition of a book mm. where they had portraits of each. And what they did, of course, is they used hand coloring. They used the <laughs> same hand coloring for both which lent them exactly the same skin tone, right? So that, I mean, mm. they, were, they were based on uh, physic, you know, they were based, they were, they were kind of portraits of generic individuals, right? They yep. were, but they were colored with the same um, hand coloring. And that was lit as, um, you know, as evidence that, they, that there was a similarity there. Um, and so, you know, that just, I think that was a really interesting example of the ways in which, you know, the, the application of hand coloring um, is creating kind of notions of racial uh, typology mm -hmm. and stuff that be, that you uh, that maybe an etching and engraving had been left a little bit more tacit in terms of shading or something. Yeah, fascinating. I, loved, I can't wait to talk more about this. Thank you so much. Very good, thanks. Questions. So, uh, Christina. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Christina, and um, I'm the, a professor at the University of Ottawa, and I'm currently co-editing with Cynthia uh, a book on engraving and uh, women in print uh, from the 18th century and uh, beginning of 19th century. So, uh, Doug, as usual, this, this is phenomenal. Thank you so much for this wonderful contribution. And um, my question relates to um, the book itself, uh, because I'm puzzled by uh, the way in which a book can control uh, to a certain extent a narrative. And if these prints were um, available independently, uh, how would, would the discourse uh, or this ideology uh, would have been manipulated or transformed? And I'm thinking specifically, uh, for example, on issues of copyright in which uh, the book would have a certain type of uh, dynamic against uh, the engraving or the Hogarth's copyright, which would be the separate sheets. And, and if you had this kind of interplay in which the books were manipulated differently, like the order would be changed and there were some anomalies in your view and, and how um, these books were really controlled and tried to preserve in, in, in their integrity. Uh, because it, it would be obviously the, the question of moral rights, as, again, if you change the order of the imagery. So this, challenging questions that books and individual sets uh, would present and if they were available in sets or parts to the whole become together so yeah thank you thanks Christina that um I the you know I do think that that, that um that Hogarth's act and the protection of image copyright does contribute to this efflorescence of illustrated books in England I think I think that that copyright protection helps it's important to note that the copyright did not, and as you, and I'm sure you know that. I mean, it doesn't extend to other countries, or Dublin. <laughs> and yeah. so, you, so, so that there were, um, so that there were knockoff images of Oriental scenery in France. Um, I'm not sure about Ireland, but you know that, and so cheaper versions of it. And they um, sometimes they would acknowledge the Daniels, sometimes they wouldn't. Didn't really matter. There was nothing they could do about it. Um, so the, but so the quality of the image was part and parcel of what was being for like the so one of the ways to protect yourself was not just for the kind of intellectual copyright of the image but for the to a kind of i think what there uh, a kind of like nobody could do a finer version of that large scale print than william daniel could they did they did make a reduced version of oriental scenery though for a smaller market and um you know and those were easier to knock off and um um, so that that's kind of one part of the question. And to your part about the ordering, I, I was really interested in that too. The vast majority of these books do number that do number the image plates. And so that you have there is a sense of progress. Um, and some of that, though, is based on being sold in parts. So a number of these, because these are such expensive publications, they and it took so long to, to etch and engrave them that they would come out in sets of four, three or fours usually. And you get them in blue wrappers. And so, for example, Oriental scenery, the, the logic is um, it's partly geographic about different parts of Southern Africa. But the main thing it was committed to was you got one animal, you got one quadruped, one landscape and one kind of view of people, you know, and it, it, with each part. And, and then that kind of contributed to the way that it added up um, and um, so yeah, so the ways in which narratives are constructed in this are very, they're, they're not novelistic, they're different, they're unique, they're unique, and it's something to think about. 
Thank you, Christina. Our next uh, question from Pamela. Hello, Pam Pamela. Good to, good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. I'm speaking from Johannesburg. I'm a professor at Weiser um, at the University of Fitzwaterstrand. And I had sort of, I guess, a three-part question. Oh, and I did go to UVA undergraduate, so that counts for um, my affiliation. So quite a many years ago. Um, okay, so one, I was interested in this idea of the haptic picturesque. Mm. And I wanted to see if you were thinking through Tina Camp's work on photography at all, um, which she uses the word haptic as well, both in terms of touching and listening. So I was wondering where the listening aspect is if you are trying to talk about the haptic. And then a second question is, I work sort of more in the Lusophone colonial world in India and Southern Africa. And I'm thinking about the sort of what colors we can attribute to certain empires. And so like, I've been thinking through the color blue with the Portuguese. And so I wanted to push you, prod you on thinking about the colors of British imperialism. Um, and then a sort of third part question and feel free to answer one, two, none, whatever. It's very casual. Uh, the third question would be sort of the publics and the, um, the counter publics and who's reading what, when, versus metropole versus the colonies and who has access to them. Um, and where are those? I mean, are they in circulation today? I, I'm sorry, I arrived late, so I probably missed well, some okay. of this. Um, but just sort of the, the idea of Michael Warner's counter publics versus publics. So who's sort of the public reading it and who are those counter publics and reading it in subversive ways or not? counter. Um, so yeah, thank you. Terrific. Wow. Th those are great questions. Thank you. And, I, and I'm gonna have to give some more thought. The Tina Camp question um, is, a, is, a, is a great one. And I, 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 came, I, I came to her work quite late. And after I had already kind of, after, basically after the book was already off to press was the first time. I, and so, um, and I have, had given almost no thought to sound and um, the other book that, that, that I came across almost exact same time as, as Tina Camps was Michael Gaudio's book on um, the oral imagination and yeah. prints in the, in the Atlantic sphere. And so this is such an interesting question. Um, I can't wait to give it more thought, but I have, it's, it was not a part of this project at all um, when I, when, as, I, as I conceived it and wrote it. Um, the colors, I'm gonna have to give some more thought to as well. I mean, there is a palette, you know, there's absolutely a palette and, um, um, that's what struck me when I was looking at the images yeah. and the thing and yeah 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 um and part of that is driven by the the process that aquatent mm -hmm. you know so for example one thing that that uh William Daniel does in a really fascinating way is that oriental scenery is is printed entirely in this kind of sepia color and then hand colored mm -hmm. for his next mm -hmm. major big book project um which was a tour around Great Britain which was viewing all these different ports around mm -hmm. the periphery, which by the way, he only, I, I'm gonna, you know, he only really thought to do this tour around Great Britain after he'd already done a tour of India and thought, well, why doesn't Britain have something like this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he prints that as in, in two colors, which is interesting. So he prints the top half of uh, the plate in a, a very soft grayish blue and mm -hmm. the bottom half in a, in a light brown. And then that already does, that's already, so, so it's kind of a la poupée, but super roughly. So it didn't take much time to ink the plate. He runs mm -hmm. it off and then he's already got a kind of tonal plate. Um, so all, I'm, all I can say about the coloring, particularly with the Daniels in mind, is that, you know, from the very start, they're thinking of how the plate is going to look colored. Right. right? And right. that... And that they want it to be as, uh, as, as there's a there's a a quietness and a peacefulness to these images that they're really looking to inculcate. Um, that is, you know, again, which is an illusion, of course, of all colonial violence or all, you know, unpleasantness altogether. So that's all I have, kind of for color. But I'll give yeah. It can, I, can I just come in there real quick? Because yeah. it struck me that some of the coloring or that palette was very similar to that hand tinting of black and white photographs that took place. Right. Um, for you know sort of you know like my parents were immigrants from india to the states and i remember seeing ones of those very similar colors of my parents from their marriage um and the ways in which the elites sort of uh, looked up to those colorings as a way for their own um for their own black and white photos and that sense of color so i'm just wondering if there's something to tease out there with the um not not only the the british side but also the sort of the indian colonial subjectivity and if the, yeah. that aesthetic gets 
it's, that's a terrific that's a terrific down. question tom I, do you want to say anything on that because tom is now working on lithography in a slightly later period that would mm -hmm. also kind of of course bleed over i mean with photography as well yeah yeah I mean, when I when I was hearing the question, actually, it's that there's, there's a very, very um, good section in the book, which is talking about how, in many ways, actually, um, I think it uses uh, Joel Snyder's idea of this sort of lag, uh, this lag between the, the chest out and what people think they can achieve with certain mediums. Um, and that in some ways, aquatint is closer to, to photography. Uh, lithography, in some ways, is a return to this this interest in having the author's hand on the on the stone um, before it becomes, you know, chromolithography and you know towards advertising is slightly different. But in terms of what artists are doing, um, for instance, uh, Charles Doyley in in India, it's very much the attempt to use uh, print medium to to sort of push himself as an amateur artist. It's he's in the work. Um, whereas I think this uh, aquatint almost allows someone like William Daniel to remove him, himself and uh, mm. produce something that is more about the sort of this pseudo objective idea of the phenomenal sort of phenomenological experience of seeing of the seeing the scene. So, um, yeah, I think that the link between the Douglas you make in the book between aquatint and photography and this idea of uh, the sort of phenomenological aspect of it, is, that's, there's something there, I think, to, to answer the question. Thanks. And P but Pamela, when I was thinking about that connection between aquatint photography, I was not thinking about color because I was thinking, of course, photographs aren't, you know, are, un are black and white. But of course, that's not true. As you, you know, I mean, there, there yeah. were ways around that. And so I yeah, love that. Yeah, there's a whole long history. I, yeah. yeah, there's a whole long history. That that. Yeah. Thank you. And the, the publics, I, I'll, I'll skip that question for right now. Um, but I mean, it's the um, there there is. Um, I, I, I will just mention that there was a there were uh, subscriptions, particularly for Indian publications, by Indian consumers, uh, particularly in Bombay. There's a lot of Indian subscribers for some of those for a James Whale series, and of course, I think we can wonder whether it's because they liked the the images or just because that they felt that this was a, a necessary kind of form of patronage that they had to extend to in order to to gain business contracts or uh, formal relationships. This is such a fascinating exchange. I, I, I wish we had a whole hour, but we can we can go until the quarter. Doug, Doug are you okay oh, with? I'm, absolutely, I'm loving this. Yes. Yes, because it's an amazing conversation, and and honestly, your the aqua tint of the Carla caves, it took me back. It's a biographical note, you know. I did my early schooling in Bombay, and as part of our history class, we had an excursion to uh, oh, all the, all the caves, the Carla caves in Lunala, and uh, and then of course Ajanta Elora, and and so on. So it just yeah, and there's so much to, to talk about that. But there's Alison, Alison Bigelow has her hand up. So Alison, over to you. Hi, everyone. Sorry to take us away from this thread. Um, my question was actually somewhere between Calvin's and Christina's. And Douglas, you mentioned that the book or book art is a particular way of understanding empire, that it sheds light in ways that other artistic forms do not. And you've sort of given us a couple of reasons why that might be, but I wonder if you can just really put a fine point on that. You talked a little bit about the increased circulation of the form. You talked a little bit about the ability of artists to participate in the genre, in the practice and the style, but it, it resembles ways that they've been trained. I mean, those are just two of the reasons you sketched. I'm sure that there are others that you analyze. Why is it in your mind that the book in this, in this particular kind of book tells us something about empire that other forms and other media do not? Thank you, thank you. I, I love that question um, because that's something that I have continued to turn over after you know finishing the project and that the, the book as a, as a form of imperial knowledge is so, um, pervasive, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries, at least. And, um, and that, you know, when, um, you know, Aboriginal artists in the 20th century, when they object to um, colonial forms of knowledge and white settler colonialism, they, they constantly refer to the book of the law and the book and you know you're constantly you know you guys are always using the book and it's a, it takes like on a kind of metaphorical value but it's also very real because it does seem like everything gets written down and published and that is the that is the quint quintessential form of 
imperial uh, intellectual authority, right? Or, or the kind of authority by which um, these things are established. And I think that that is at work in these projects. Like there are ways in which it made, so I, I choose, I have one example in the book where um, there is a thing called um, the loan deposit rule, where if you, when you publish a book in England, if you wanted copyright, you had to deposit 11 of your finest copies in the 11 universities in the UK. Um, and, um, and then that would grant you protection. So a book like Oriental Scenery costs 200 guineas, which is extravagant. I mean, it was more than a full length portrait. It was an extravagant amount of money. And so, and those universities would have been one of the, some of the only places that would have actually paid for that book, <laughs> as we all know, and, you know, with our own academic books, like if, if, if the university libraries didn't support us, nobody would. And so, um, so um, William Daniel was um, subpoenaed in a number of cases about, about this and um, for parliament to select parliamentary committees. And he kind of just makes the point that this has to be a book. He doesn't really make the case for why, but the, um, of course, because prints combine text, you can, you can label them, you can add tons of text actually at the bottom, but it had to have letterpress and it had to be in a book form. Even if it was sold in parts, it had to ultimately be bound as a book. And, um, and it was destined for the library rather than for the cabinet or something like that. And, and I just think that this is it because that marks it as an imperial form of knowledge in key ways that were, um, that were in excess of, of any kind of practical sales uh, strategy, or I don't know, maybe, I, maybe, maybe it was crucial to the sales strategy too, but it just, um, it struck me that there was an, an instance in which it actually cost him so much more to, to, to issue this as a book when there were all kinds of ways around that had he chosen to do that, but he didn't want to do that. That's a, t that's not an answer. That's a, that's a, that's like a parable to your question, but. No, it's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Douglas. Um, so if there are no more questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Douglas for that immensely rich book and that fascinating talk. Please join me in thanking Douglas and, and Tom. Uh, yes, Tom, we wish you could, you could have visited us, but uh, maybe you will very soon <laughs> now, now that you've made contact with Douglas and, and Pamela and, and all uh, uh, Christina. Uh, all of you participated in the conversation. Uh, thank you again, and, and see you at our next Mellon Book Seminar. Bye. Thank you.